the Christian life is a life of commitment. That ought to be a given. And of course, it's a commitment to, to God, to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a commitment to the work of the kingdom. Uh, it's a commitment to proclaiming the gospel of salvation. Any which way that you describe it, commitment is very, very crucial. Because this commitment also um, is what is needed for us to advance in our spiritual lives. So what commitment translates to, uh, first of all, holiness. We are told that you are to strive for holiness. It doesn't just happen. God wants it for all of us, but it doesn't just happen. And we might even say to the Lord, yes, Lord, I want it. Make me holy. No, it doesn't work that way. God provides whatever grace is needed, but we need to strive for that holiness. We need to work at it. We need to put our human efforts. Of course, not, not just trusting on our human strength. We never just do that, but we trust fully in the Lord and make use of all the gifts that he has given us. So we strive for holiness. And then there's family renewal. MFC is all about family renewal. And we all know how difficult and challenging that is. And in the world, there is no longer that commitment. That's why so many marriages and families break apart, truly tragic. And it has said it's consequences on the life of the world and even life within uh, the church because it is not according to God's design. But people might get married, they fall in love, and uh, they think that just their love for one another will see them through. But then many of them discover later on no, that that cannot be enough. So many people were so much in love, later on they, they split up because situations change. Uh, they need to enter more deeply into marriage to understand more God's plan and to cooperate with the Spirit of God in order to strengthen uh, our marriages. And that takes a lot of commitment. Uh, that's why as uh, those who are married uh, know the sacramental bond, the, the, the commitment that we make, you know, that it is for better or for worse, sickness or health, and richer or poorer till death to us part. And wow, that's commitment. Because we never know. How will it be? Today, fine, we're so much in love. Five years from now, fine. But how about after that? And we, we look around and so many people that we even looked up to, uh -huh. perfect couple, but now they're separated. So it takes a lot of commitment for family uh, strengthening and family marriage and family renewal in the work of pro-life and this is one of the greatest assaults of the enemy today the whole aspect of abortion many many uh, many things uh, many bad things are uh, all about abortion the desire of the globalist elite to depopulate the world and ultimately it's about abortion that's why the fight for and against abortion is so, so strong. And, and the, those who promote abortion, telling all sorts of lies and calling it healthcare and it's good for the woman and all of these things that they put forth just to destroy uh, the life that is in the womb. But almost uh, the, the whole world and all the institutions of, of government, of power, and, and big tech, and uh, the, 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 the moneyed uh, elites, and, and world bodies, they're all for it. And so if you're authentically pro-life, we say authentically pro-life because they are those who say they are pro-life, but they either allow abortion or, or do nothing to speak against abortion. So... Uh, all of these forces, and if you're pro-life, uh, you know, you're in for quite a struggle. And uh, pro-lifers are being assaulted in many different ways, including being uh, sued and uh, losing their livelihood and being fined and even put in jail. So that requires commitment. It would be so easy for people who to say, 
well, well, why do I need that? I just mind my own business. And that's exactly what these dark evil forces want to happen. To silence the people of God and for you, just mind your own business. No? And then don't get involved in anything like this. So commitment mm -hmm. in spite of the great uh, persecution, oppression and suffering and pain, we still need to be at it because it is right, because it is good, because it is true, because it is the will of God, because it's what uh, God wants uh, his people to rise up in defense of. So pro-life. And then there are many other things. Uh, work with the poor. Poverty has been with us from the very start, from time immemorial. And today it is still there. And many poor people are still oppressed even by those who profess to, to help them. But they, they dangle uh, a, a few dollars here and there. But first you need to accept contraception, condoms, abortion, LGBT. Oh, otherwise, you don't receive any help. So there's that uh, uh, new brand of colonialism that has uh, come in. Well, it's always been, been here in the world. No? They're near, not really out to help, out of the generosity of their heart, these powerful nations and these moneyed uh, 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 billionaires. It's not out of the generous, generosity of their heart. They have an agenda. They're just pursuing their agenda and imposing their, their will on helpless people. People of Africa say, uh, what we need is food. What we need is authentic uh, health care. You know? And we need, of course, all the other basic things uh, uh, for, for life, uh, shelter, clean water. But what you give us are, are, are condoms and, and all of these uh, liberal leftist, modernist, diabolical ideas that threaten societies and, and traditional cultures and the, the uh, inherent unity of the family. So that, that is how it is in the world. There's a lot of money that supposedly is for work with the poor, but much of that money is tainted and much of that money uh, has an agenda with it. So if you authentically want to uh, help the poor, it's also very, very challenging. And of course, because poverty is such a uh, massive, uh, uh, ingrained uh, thing in many uh, societies, we're not even talking of the poverty of spirit, but uh, just the material, physical poverty. So it will be challenging if you want to get into that work. But we do need to get into that work because that is what Jesus says. And he himself identifies with the least of his uh, brethren. And whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. Jesus says, what you don't do, uh, you don't do to me. So it cannot be escaped. Jesus came to bring blood tidings to the poor. He wants us to do so as well. Uh, in different ways, of course. There are those who will focus on it. Uh, but everyone is to have that mindset uh, for the poor. But it's an area that is so widespread, so massive, so ingrained that it will require a great commitment for those who want to work along this line. Without commitment, again, it is uh, so easy to, to give up. Uh, it's easy to feel the tiredness. Not getting tired, because we will get tired. We're not super, super men or women. Uh, yes, when you work at things with the passion, when you give up yourself, you will get tired. There's nothing wrong with that. The antidote to that is to rest. <laughs> and, and obviously, uh, we, we need our, our well-earned rest. But it's easy to, to tire of, of that whole effort and, and just to, to give up. Or there are those, if uh, they lack commitment, they will just float along. Uh, okay, I, I hear these teachings, I read the Bible, and yeah, what you say is uh, all okay. So yeah, uh, I, I don't dispute that, I agree with you, but they're just floating along. And, and it cannot be that way. You will be washed away by the tsunami of evil. Uh, oftentimes, you need to 
swim against the tide. So it's not just proof of So it requires a lot of commitment. Without commitment, people will just complain. What's wrong with complaining? Well, it puts you in a negative mood. Now, we, we can obviously uh, talk about, hey, this is wrong. Uh, what if it were this way? Uh, hopefully, it will not be this difficult. So we, we, can, we can talk about that. We can uh, ask God to help us in all of that. But it is not to have a complaining attitude. Because you know that when you choose to be Jesus' disciple and to do this kind of work, there will be all of these hardships. Oh. And, and suffering and persecution. So you know that. You don't need to complain about that. And, and the way that you don't complain about that is when you're committed. And, and you just plug on. You just uh, keep on. Sure, take a rest if you need to. Sure, take a break, a short break if you need to. But get back there uh, into the, the, the fray because God has called you and uh, the more that there are in the army of God, then uh, the better it will be. Then, of course, without commitment, it's so easy to be defeated by the enemy. We always speak about being in a spiritual war, which we truly are. And it's a brutal war. And we face a very, very powerful enemy who is uh, intent on destroying the people of God. And, and the enemy is constantly assaulting, never giving up. And, and that's why you see the enemy has been very successful in today's world in imposing uh, its dominion on, on the world. And so many things are, are wrong, so much darkness, so much uh, evil. And part of this has happened or maybe much of it has happened because the people of God have not uh, risen up to defend the work of God, to defend faith, family, and life. And not only to defend, but to go on counter-offensive. The best defense is offense. So, you know, if, if we don't have that commitment, this is our call, this is who we are, holy warriors. So you need to be committed. You know, just you just need to go at it and wait on the victory of God. We know that the victory of God is there, but we don't know in particular circumstances how it will happen. At times, the Lord might allow us to suffer defeats. I put that in quotations. Well, because He needs to teach us a lot of things. Things. Maybe we're not that, uh, no longer that dependent on Him. Maybe we don't pray so hard. Maybe we're trusting more in our own uh, capabilities. Maybe we're making much more use of our uh, human uh, thinking. So. You need to be defeated. Maybe we're not that that uh, 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 intimately connected with him. Maybe we're looking already, maybe not knowing it, hopefully, uh, to the other idols in our lives. What happened to Israel, the people of God? God assured them, I will be with you. And you will defeat your enemies if you live out your covenant. But whenever they stray from their covenant, uh, whenever they especially turned to, to idols where rebellious were disobedience, they were defeated. They needed to be defeated so that they will be brought back to their, to their senses. So you, you, we, we talk of uh, uh, commitment that, that however uh, things are in defeat or victory with the, with the lows and the ups, we are just there. Commitment is so very, very crucial. You, 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 you can see commitment all over the, the uh, scriptures in both the Old and the, the New Testament. But uh, I'll, I'll cite one, I'll cite two, but uh, one from the uh, Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Uh, the, uh, at, at some point, uh, Israel demanded to have a king. So they had uh, uh, kings and they had a series of kings. Many of them turned away from the Lord. But one king who uh, kept to the Lord, who, who uh, took out the, the, the idols, uh, who was faithful to the Lord, was uh, King Asa. He was a reformer king in uh, Israel. 
anyway, this is what we read what uh, Asariah told King Asa in 2 Chronicles 15 verse 7. But as for you, be strong and do not slack off, for there shall be a reward for what you do. Simple phrase, but packed with meaning to, to the king whom God has placed uh, in authority over his people who will now determine whether they, they stick with God or turn away from God or how they live their, their lives in him. And uh, Azariah telling Asa, you, as for you, you, I'm talking to you. Because you are the king. On you will depend a lot. You are the, the, the leader. Be strong. Do not slack off. So be committed. Be firm. Be steadfast. Be built on rock. Do what you are supposed to do. Do not take it easy. Do not grow weary. So that talking about commitment. And he says, for there shall be a reward for what you do. If you do God's will, you will be rewarded. That is for certain. Now, of course, uh, we, we can talk uh, uh, a, a long time about what reward really means. It's reward uh, according to God's uh, uh, values, which is, of course, uh, always the best. Uh, sometimes we look to reward as... Uh, well, well what, what I want, the, the material reward, the, the so-called uh, blessings uh, that are there. And when we don't get it, we might be disappointed. But God's rewards might be different. Again, you might be suffering defeats because God wants to, to, to discipline you and bring you back closer to himself. Again, you might be suffering great hardships because uh, God wants to uh, build up your uh, spiritual stamina. So there are, there are many, many different things. But we know that God intends to reward the faithfulness of his people. And of course, the ultimate reward is making it to heaven. But even in this life, there will be a lot of uh, blessings. So uh, it's crucial that we remain committed. Then the uh, um, Bible passage from... The New Testament that I just want to mention with regard, the, regard to uh, Paul and his uh, ministry. Now, Paul, you know him. Uh, he was Saul who was converted, he was a great persecutor of the people of God, was converted and became the great apostle Paul. And even when he had just called, uh, Jesus was telling him how much to suffer, that he would have to suffer. And he did suffer a lot. He, he talks about it a lot of times in, in his uh, letters, his epistles. You know? And uh, that's why we, when, when we read this, we see the, the, the blessing that is suffering when you suffer for the cause of Christ. But uh, here is Paul. Uh, listen to what he has to say in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 9. We are afflicted in every way but not constrained, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. So you see, you see, so afflicted in every way, but not constrained. We go on. Paul goes on. He, 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 was, he, he didn't reach a point where, oh, I can't take this anymore. Too much affliction. Uh, uh, I, I give up. No, he was afflicted in every way, but not constrained. And, and he would be perplexed like a number of us might. You know, well, what, is, what is God doing? Uh, uh, what does God want to achieve in this? Uh, why is God not answering my desperate prayer uh, in this particular uh, uh, decision? You know? And some people are led to despair. Some people are led to turn away from God. Uh, some people are led to look for other gods that would be more accommodating. But not Paul, perplexed, but not driven to despair. That's talking about commitment. So he was persecuted, but not abandoned. The, the people uh, often abandoned. He, uh, in one of his uh, epistles, he talks about those who abandoned him. 
But he he knew he was never abandoned by God. And that is the person who really counts. It is it is God. Anyone and everyone can abandon you, but as long as uh, God is there for you, then you go on with your commitment. In fact, the authentic Christian who does the work of God, who engages in spiritual warfare, will be assaulted by the world that is out there. And even by people that we think are our, well, our, our friends or actually our relatives or our uh, close confers in uh, Christian community, it, it will come. And we are not dependent upon them. Of course, we, we, we would uh, uh, want uh, all of these uh, close relationships to be really good relationships. But well, when we're talking about persevering and just enduring and get, get, getting on, uh, we know that persecution might come, great challenges might come, but God never abandons his faithful people. Uh -huh. Now, if you stray away, if you cut yourself off, God would not want to abandon you. But if you make a choice, then that's it. You're, you're, you're cut off. But if you're there clinging to God and, and continuing to walk in his ways, you're never abandoned. Then Paul says, struck down, but not destroyed. So you, you might fall flat on your face. You might be struck down. You might be suffering so many things as Paul did. He, he, he listed it. Uh, but you will not be destroyed as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. That will remain. You will be intact in that. You might be suffering loss in, in many different ways, materially, physically, but uh, emotionally and spiritually, you are there with God. And, and uh, the, the God will not allow the dark forces to destroy his authentic uh, people. So this is what uh, it was with Paul. And then in the next verse, in verse 10, uh, it has to do, of course, with the Lord, with, with Jesus. So it says here, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. So in the first place, we look to what the Lord Jesus has already done for us. He suffered, he died for us. So can we not suffer and even die also for him? And, and that's why we talk of the cross, how the cross can be such a blessing, how we can share in some way with, with uh, uh, the uh, sufferings of Christ, which he did for, for our sake. So we, we look to that and we do everything for the sake of our Lord uh, Jesus. And in all of that, because we are weak, uh, human flesh so we we look to jesus we do the work of god and we are empowered by the spirit of god so going back to verse 7 to corinthians 4 verse 7 but we hold this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing power may be of god and not from us so that's part of god's design we are weak, we are, we are human, we are, we are sinful, we are earthen vessels. And we should never come to the point where we think, wow, I'm so great, you know, I'm so empowered, and I can do all things for, for God. <laughs> so say, uh, doing it for God, but doing it out, uh, out of pride and looking to your own uh, resource or your own knowledge or your own maturity, or your own connections, or uh, your own ways of uh, doing things to do the work of God. God wants to, to make it clear that the power comes from Him. And praise and thank God for that. I would not want to be relying on my own power, no matter how much uh, knowledge and experience and connections and how strong the body is. I would not ask want us to rely on human power, but we rely simply on the surpassing power that comes from God. But that's what helps bring us to even greater uh, commitment. You know? So, oh, it's already 8.32. That, that's just the introduction. <laughs> so, commitment, it's a, it's a big word. 
And uh, living it out will certainly entail uh, hard work and sacrifice. We should not uh, take it lightly. Uh, so I'd like to look at the work commitment, what I enjoy doing, uh, as an acronym. Uh, so commitment is uh, much more than just 10 letters in a particular word, but I'd like to look at 10 aspects of the Christian life that relate to commitment. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, commitment. Uh, first of all, the letter C. Now, you know, you, 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 you listen to these uh, 10 words, traits, uh, virtues. You can make up your own. Uh, there, there's so much uh, that can really go uh, into, into it. You know? But we will take a look at uh, uh, some of them. You know, see, it can be courage, it can be compassion. You know? uh, but uh, what, what I'm using C for is uh, caring. Caring for and loving uh, others. Why should we be committed to God's call to us? Well, uh, because we're supposed to, to love God. We're supposed to love our family that uh, God gives for us to uh, care for. We're supposed to love the church. We are part of the church. It's the, the, uh, the body of Christ that, that uh, was instituted by Jesus in order to carry on uh, his work, where we live and work together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. So uh, all of this uh, uh, needing to care for uh, the very work of, of God. Now, you, you know what the basic commandment of love is. So love, love is the most basic commandment. And Jesus reduced the uh, whole prophets and the whole law into two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor. In uh, Mark 12, verses 30 to 31, love the Lord your God with your whole mind, uh, soul, and strength, and uh, love your neighbors, you love yourself. Now, when you love, so the basic commandment of love, the basic trait of a Christian, the distinctive feature of a Christian, which is which is love. You know? uh, when you love, then you care. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that is a lot of what it means. Then you care for the people that you love. Then you take care uh, of them. Mm -hmm. Now, two greatest commandments, love of God, love of neighbor. But God takes care of himself. We don't need to take care of God. But certainly, God calls upon us to take care of our neighbor. And our neighbor, we ourselves, neighbor to someone else, uh, uh, need the, the care of, of, of others. So who are neighbors? Well, the traditional uh, 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 meaning of uh, neighbor is, uh, you know, you live in this home, the one has be beside you, that's your neighbor. Uh, and, and that's true. But uh, for us in the Christian life, uh, neighbors are those who, well, of course, you are to love, but who are within your your circle of uh, influence. So first of all, your closest neighbor, your family, your spouse, uh, first of all, and, and your children. So your family, your, your home. Then there are the brothers and sisters in uh, church organizations or Christian communities, the uh, ecclesial associations, because God has called you in particular to come together to do a particular work, given your particular uh, calling or, or charism. And you need to care for one another. You need to, to love one another. And then, of course, there are uh, others in, in larger circles, uh, the poor, uh, who are in need, whom we talked about uh, earlier. You know? There are uh, our friends, uh, social friends you know, from school, from, from work, uh, from, from our neighborhood uh, uh, subdivision uh, or, or place of uh, residence. And then there are co-workers at the office of so far who uh, go to secular jobs. Then there's even uh, our enemy, you know, and God tells us to love our enemy. So when you're supposed to love your enemy, then that means you love everyone. Uh -huh. So you, you talk of neighbor, the close-in neighbor, but also those who are everyone else 
In fact, in our talk, in our CLS, LCS, uh, we say that the neighbor, uh, according to the parable of the Good Samaritan, is someone who is in need. And that particular person was uh, beaten up and robbed, so he was uh, in need of help uh, to be for, for healing and to be brought to a place where he could be treated. But when you talk of people in need, practically everyone has some kind of need. Whether it's just for a friend, whether it's just from, for some uh, emotional uh, uh, challenge. So we, we uh, look to our neighbors and we must care for and, and love them. And in particular, when you talk of uh, neighbors, how, how do you do that? Well, uh, last week we saw, we, we talked about the Ten uh, Commandments. And this is what uh, also Paul tells the Romans, uh, how we are to look to the commandments and in that way care for our neighbor. In Romans 13 verses 8 to 10, he says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. What is that law? He, says, he goes on. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence Love is the fulfillment of the law. Can you imagine a world where authentic Christian love uh, predominates and care for others, others, even our enemies? Can you imagine what a world that would be? The world as would be uh, ideal in the eyes and the intent of God, where there will be peace, where there will be uh, good order where there will be security, where there will be none of all of these things that uh, you see uh, happening in the world all, all around us, precisely because people are not living out the uh, Ten Commandments, especially the Seven Commandments that relate to uh, other persons. But if we live them out, as uh, Paul says here, then you know, uh, amazing things will uh, really, will really happen in uh, society. Now, when we talk about care, uh, talk about love, we're not talking about the uh, how do, how do I put it uh, the the mushy type, you know, because people think about love. Oh, I'm I'm in love, so uh, my my head is in the clouds, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, we're 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 talking not just about being nice and political correctness in the church today. Uh, uh, talks about being nice. Just be nice to people. And so don't ever talk about their sin because, ah, that's not nice. You're offending the other person. No, you're not really caring and loving that person, which is all wrong. No? Because precisely to tell the person that you love and that you're caring for, uh, that, that, that he or she is uh, doing wrong so that hopefully they can, uh, they will accept, they will understand, they will make, make amends. If we don't do that, then we are actually failing in, in caring for them. So it's not just accompaniment, uh, acceptance, embrace. All of that is important, especially of the sinner, but it is talking of the person's sin. That is how we care for, for others. And th this because ultimately uh, caring is about the soul. The the, the reason why Jesus came into the world was to bring salvation to, to everyone. And it's only as we are saved that we will make it to heaven, to be restored back to the very intent of God when he created the whole universe and our first parents and put them in Eden. So that's when it will go full circle when we finally make it to heaven. So that is what caring is about. What, what good will it be when you care for someone, you accept your company, you embrace, but since you never talk about the sin and the person continues in massive, grave uh, uh, wrongdoing, and at the end of his or her life, uh, uh, he or she, uh, he, 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 he dies and goes to hell. That's not caring. That is failure to care. That is not mercy. That is false mercy. So it, it, it cannot be that way. 
unfortunately today there are many who do work with the poor uh, some refer to them as uh, social justice warriors who see only the the body the the material uh, but they fail to see uh, the soul the the spiritual you know? and that's why they will readily uh, okay think in terms of uh, how can we feed them how can we clothe them how can we build uh, shelters uh, but not not find it uh, in contradiction, you know, that good work that God wants them to do is not in contradiction to also insisting on, on uh, contraceptives or abortion or acceptance of LGBT. That's why they can put the two together. They're just looking at the body, at the material. But at the end of the day, no, no, it cannot be just that way. At the end of the day, why are we to love as a reflection also of our love of God and we love others, including our enemy, it is uh, to, to uh, in some way, somehow, be used as an instrument of God in order to help bring that uh, person to uh, salvation. So C is for caring. O is uh, obedience to, to God. If you love God, you obey Him. And God has always said that from His covenant with uh, His uh, chosen people and, uh, you know, uh, telling them, uh, well, I, I love you and you are to love me. And the way that manifests your love is to obey me and to get out my ways. And that's also important because that's how God can manifest his love for his people. When they live according to his ways, then he can really care for them in every way. But if they turn away from God, no, he cannot bless them because then they will uh, remain in their sin and say, oh, look, look, the blessing of God when we're doing the sin, when we're disobedient, when we're rebelling, when we're into idolatry. So that doesn't happen. So the manifestation of the love of God uh, certainly comes when we uh, obey Him. And again, one of the things He tells us is, okay, you, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And when we obey God, we actually not just love our neighbor, we love ourselves because it's for our good. And, and uh, the, the only way that our good will come to pass according to the design of God, according to the will of God, not according to the world's face. That is always different. Sometimes it's totally contradictory uh, to how God it is with God. But how how to to uh, uh, receive the fullness of the love of God and the blessings of God is when we uh, obey. Then that's when we love our neighbor. We also love ourselves. Now we obedience is in all things. And and how do we know? Because there are people whom we can see uh, they're disobedient. Again, uh, the, uh, those who claim to be devout Catholics but are pro-abortion, so we see very clearly they're disobedient, but I don't know, are, are they just completely darkened in mind or did they receive bad catechesis or they did not receive uh, teaching from the pastors of the church? That's also uh, possible. So how do you know what we need to obey as far as God is concerned? Uh, well, uh, we uh, we uh, learned two themes ago, the year before last year, seems so long ago, but uh, 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 that uh, we are to be founded on rock, but to be founded on rock is to listen to God's words and act on those words. So we need to know God's works. We, we need to study. Uh, we need to read the Bible. Uh, we need to know what the church authentically uh, teaches. And... When we know, then we must uh, obey. We, we don't just dream up things on our own or what are our preferences. Uh, and worse, the, uh, we don't look to the false teachers and the false prophets. So know what is authentically uh, Christian teaching and then you, you, you live out. Uh, you, you live that out. You, you obey. So the problem today aside from the many who just disobey. <laughs> this is not important to them. God is not important to them. So they just uh, disobey. 
but uh, one big problem today is uh, many uh, i i would like to believe do not know because if i don't believe that they do not know then that means they're just terribly lost they know but they disobey if you deliberately disobey you're lost but if you don't know then hopefully you, know, you can be instructed you can and 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 the truth will find a home in your heart it will ring a bell as far as you're concerned a big gong that suddenly turn, turns you around so but unfortunately there are many who do not know and then there are those who distort the authentic teachings of Christ and, and the church. And unfortunately, at times, this might be coming from clerics, from religious, even from prelates. So, and when it comes from them, at least from the, the, the uh, teachers in the church, so they, they must be right. That's why it's so important, especially in today's environment, you need to know. And of course, here in uh, MFC, we, we, we will give uh, whatever is authentic teaching or uh, based on the holy word of God. But you still need to know a lot more. And based on what we, we, we give you, you, you build up on that and you enter more deeply uh, into it. Because uh, there is already modernism within the church that is causing a lot of uh, confusion. And and uh, as, as we've said many times in this podcast, uh, with modernism, the good has become bad and the bad has become good. Uh, so we, we need to know. Uh, you need to know so that you can uh, obey. Now, uh, just well, one other aspect of obedience to God is obedience to, now uh, talking in particular of uh, Christian community, not just MFC, but others as well. Uh, obedience to the leaders that God places in community because they stand in his place so jesus is the chief shepherd but there are uh, minor shepherds that he places uh, in the body to care for the people who whom people can actually hear you know uh, you you don't hear god you you try to hear him in your spirit when he when you pray but you uh, don't actually hear him so uh, there are human uh, persons who are called by uh, Jesus the sheep shepherd to help uh, pastor his uh, uh, sheep you know? and it is important to also obey uh, these uh, leaders you know? it, it uh, Paul says in Romans 13 verses 8 to 10 owe nothing to anyone except to love one another for the one who loves another, I'm sorry, that, that's what I was, uh, that I had read earlier. So I'm, it's Romans 13, verse, verse 1. Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been established by God. And the intent of God is for uh, for good order, for unity, for, for, for peace. Now, unfortunately, at times there have been bad leaders and you're not to obey the, the bad laws that uh, bad leaders uh, try to command, as again is happening in many secular uh, societies and governments today. But generally, you, you need such kinds of leadership. Otherwise, it's free for all. You know? And especially in Christian community, where hopefully... Uh, people, especially the servant leaders, are more are attuned to the Lord and are doing the studying and are, are committed and are trying to live out the commandments of God and all of that. Uh, and they uh, support one another in uh, fulfilling uh, the, the will of God for their own lives, their families, and for community. So that's important because they are able to lead the community. What is the uh, the charism, what is the vision and mission, what is our, our calling, uh, what are we called to, to be. And then there has to be a good order and, and unity. And uh, the authority is also to be able to give proper care. It's very clear in the part of parents, for example, they are authorities in the home. So they are authorized by God to give proper care to uh, their, their children. So also in, in community. You know? And the elders know where 
God wants the community to go. So, uh, obedience to, to God and within our context uh, to those that God places uh, in authority over his uh, people, whether that's in the home or in uh, church organizations. Okay, uh, the next two letters in commitment are two M's. No? And I like to look at uh, Mary and Martha. Because we're all called to serve God, uh, serve the church, uh, serve uh, others. So we need to be authentic servants. But being an authentic servant is about who you are and what you are to do. So this is uh, very nicely exemplified in this the delightful sisters, the sisters of Lazarus, uh, Mary and Martha. So the first M is Mary or being Mary. You know? And you, you, you know the story in Luke 10 verse 39, Jesus visited their home and Mary was... Uh, uh, sitting at his feet, feet uh, listening to, to him. And of course, being formed by him as, uh, as she listened. So we need to be like Mary. We, we can't be truly committed unless we know Jesus well. Because what are you committing to? You know? and, and do you know him truly as, as uh, uh, a, a, a person? Uh, uh, a person who, who is there, who is committed to you. And, and what he says, what he has done for you, what he provides for you, how he accompanies you. So we, we need to know him. And it is when we know him that we are to grow in our great commitment as well. When we see his great love for us, that he went to the cross to suffer for me, for you individually. If you were the only person in the world at that time, obviously, this is just a, it's a matter of talking. Jesus would still have gone down, uh, uh, became man, and suffered and died for you and offered this life for you. That's his great love. That's his commitment to us. And, and so that we want you to motivate us to be committed to him as we learn of him, uh, as he, he teaches us. And, and the, the, this is the great length that uh, God went to win for us our salvation. And now uh, God is dependent upon us to carry on that uh, work of salvation. So when we look at, at uh, our, our calling, then we, uh, we, we fall back on who it is who calls us, who it is who showed us the way, who it is that suffered and died for us. And so we, we need to be at the feet of Jesus, listening to him and being formed uh, by him. Uh, he's the one who shows us the way uh, he does not, does not just tell us what to do, but he himself did it first. He himself went through uh, all the trials and difficulties and challenges and experienced uh, so much suffering and pain. So he tells us uh, he is not just uh, someone up there who has no uh, experience of things, but he really went through it all himself. So... This is about prayer, the importance of, of prayer, uh, being at the feet of, of Jesus, listening and not doing uh, all the talking. You know, many, many times for many people when they pray, they're doing the talking and when they feel as if, uh, uh, well, what, what can I say to the Lord? They, they feel as if, oh, I, uh, I, I no longer know how, how to pray. What, what am I going to, to say now? You just sit at the feet of Jesus. And listen to him in your heart, with your thought, with your with your mind, with your with your heart. You no, know? uh, try uh, let him speak to you. you no, know? and of course you you read the scriptures and God speaks through the words that are that are there. So this is what is uh, in, in important. You know? importance of, of prayer. And when when Martha complained against uh, uh, Mary to Jesus, we see that uh, later. Uh, Jesus told her, uh, Mary uh, chose the better part. You know? And and of course, prayer, we know, is actually the foundation of uh, service. You you cannot, you, you will easily get uh, tired uh, when, when, when you serve if you are not founded and grounded on, on prayer. So commit to pray every day. 
In fact, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, uh, pray without ceasing. So that means 24-7, uh, we're praying all the time. And uh, that is in every circumstance, not meaning to say you're necessarily at your prayer nook, but it is being in communication with God. It is having a deep uh, communion uh, with, with God, uh, being knowledgeable about how we are in His presence each and every time, and how we ought to do uh, things according to, to His will, and asking Him in every circumstances that we face throughout the day, uh, please uh, um, uh, teach me, please, please uh, tell me how I am to, to, to act. You know? And in prayer, when, when you feel good, and you're there praising God, worshiping Him, thanking Him, uh, you can spirit with that, go ahead and do that. But if you feel bad, then all the more uh, you need to be consoled by God. And you get your consolation at the feet of Jesus. So you, you remain there. So commitment, uh, the commitment to, to, to pray and, and marry uh, in this particular case. Wow, wonderful. Jesus has come into our home. Uh, what an opportunity, what a, what a blessing. So just there, listening to him. And then the other M in commitment is Martha being Martha. Uh, this is about uh, doing Christian uh, service. So when Jesus came, Martha, of course, you know, to serve God, to serve uh, her Lord. Uh, she was busy in the kitchen preparing things, what he's going to eat. And then she noticed that uh, Mary was just there, just there sitting. And she was so busy, she was so tired, wipe, wiping the sweat uh, away. So uh, told Jesus, uh, Lord, tell her to, to help me. Oh, and, and again, Jesus said, no, Mary has chosen the better part. The uh, Benedictines have this, uh, their, their uh, what do you call that? <laughs> their, their, their belief, uh, ora and lab et labora. So pray and work. So the, the, the two are very, very uh, crucial, uh, very, very important. And they provide the right balance uh, for the uh, individual's uh, calling. You know? uh, now it also, that, that particular balance depends on one's particular circumstances. So there are nuns, for example, that are called to be contemplative, to be cloistered. They never go out uh, into, into the world to serve the world. And there are many things that uh, need to, to be done to, to serve the world. But that is their particular calling and how wonderful it is. And part of their uh, uh, um, service, of course, is to pray for people. And just by their sanctity, you know, because the, the kingdom of God, there needs to be saintly people that are there. Whatever that person is doing, wherever that person is residing, but uh, holy, uh, sanctified people. So that's that's what this nuns uh, ought to be. So spend most of most of their time in prayer. Now, on the other hand, you might be a a, a nurse or a doctor and a COVID frontliner. So some hospitals are overwhelmed. So you're doing so much and you have no more. Hardly time to pray. You take a quick prayer when, when you wake up to start the day, but when you go home, you're so tired, so you say a short prayer. And, and so you're more on the, the service, the, the work part, than the prayer part. But then in reality, what you do is your offering to God. It is, it is prayer. So how you actually balance that depends on particular circumstances. But the two are very, very uh, crucial. Prayer is a foundation for service, and service in turn is uh, guided and empowered by, by prayer. So commitment is uh, necessary here because it's, it's not easy uh, to pray without uh, ceasing and to give your life uh, uh, in service for, for others. So commitment is very, very critical. Okay, let me move on to I, uh, intercession. Uh, we read in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, First of all, then, I ask that supplications, prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be offered for uh, everyone. You know? 
So, for what? Uh, in the next verse, verse 2. For kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. So, you know, it's talking about how authorities are placed uh, by, by, by God. And unfortunately, they're not necessarily all, all good or doing the will of God, but uh, uh, authority uh, in the body, whether it's uh, in a state with, with government, uh, in, in Christian community, are placed by, by God. So we need to, to uh, intercede. We need to pray for, for those in authority uh, so that we might experience uh, verse 2. Uh, for kings and for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all devotion and dignity. So there will be peace in our lives. So there will be good order. So that there will be uh, religious freedom. You know? And we can uh, devote ourselves to our faith and uh, remain in our dignity as uh, sons and daughters of, of, of God. You know? uh, so it's for God's will to be, to be done. In verse 4, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Who wills God, who wills everyone to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So again, there is authority to care for God's people, especially within the church, pastors who take care of the, the sheep. Uh, and the ultimate aim is not just to serve against as we, we have been seeing, but uh, to serve uh, such that people can be helped to make it to uh, heaven. So we were talking uh, and knowledge of the truth. So we're talking about them uh, learning what, what is the truth because it's the truth that sets you free. And that's why when there are falsehoods, even within the church, uh, one should speak out about what is authentically true because at the end of the day, it's all about salvation. That is the most important uh, uh, outcome that Jesus wants to happen in our lives. So we intercede now. Love your enemies. Okay. So uh, we, we also uh, intercede for our enemies. We, we read in Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say to you, Jesus saying, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Well, because perhaps uh, it's only God who can really make a change in that person's life. So how will... How will that person no longer be my enemy? And this enemy keeps coming against me, persecuting me. So you pray uh, that he will change, that God would touch your lives, would intervene in his life so that he will stop persecuting. And this, this, this love, this prayer for enemies, uh, again, it's not just an, uh, uh, about an emotional thing. Because if it's about emotions, then you won't feel like doing it. Or if you pray, you're praying that God strike him down. <laughs> But, but it's not about emotion. But again, going back to the fundamental, to the basic, it's the intent to save. Because God loves all uh, people. We just take a look at various aspects of uh, intercession. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, there was a time of the judges. Uh, they were military leaders that uh, took care of the people of God. Then uh, after that, uh, the people wanted a king like uh, other nations. So Samuel was telling them, uh, you, you don't know what you're asking. That's not going to be a good thing. Uh, so he, he warned them uh, and, and uh, warned them uh, and the king uh, to be to, to really obey uh, God. In the first letter of Samuel, chapter 12, verse 23, uh, he says, as for me, Far be it from me to sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you and to teach you the good and right way. So Samuel, the, the, the priest, the prophet, uh, who said, well, this is my task. I need to pray for, for you. Otherwise, I sin against the Lord. And that's important. When God calls you to do something and you don't do it, it is a sin of omission. And at times, the sins of omissions are even worse than the sins of commission because God wants you to do something and you don't do it. And so his will, not only in your own life, but in the person that uh, he would have wanted you to, to uh, relate with. You know? So, so uh, I uh, 
pray for you to teach you the right way so i intercede for you as someone was was saying to the people and to the king and i i teach you in verse 24 1 Samuel 12, verse 24 says, But you must fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. So it's not just intercession. So again, it's not just uh, uh, politically correct uh, acceptance of uh, people and I'll pray for you. you know, but it is telling them what uh, a person needs to do. And that is to fear the Lord, to serve him faithfully with all your, your heart. So you not only intercede, but you speak forcefully when you have the opportunity to, to do so, to actually help that person along. You know? And then in the next verse, verse 25, it says, If instead you continue to do evil, both you and your king shall be swept away. So part of speaking the truth to the person is warning. So when we, with the political correctness of just acceptance and accompaniment, there's no warning. No, it's just warm, fuzzy uh, 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 acceptance. No. Uh, warm, not warm. When it should be warm. No. Be prophetic. Speak out. If there's wrong that is happening, then speak out. Of course, there are ways of doing that in the right way so as not to, to drive away the person completely. But at the end of the day, you need to speak what is right and just and, and true. You know? Now, intercession is, is powerful. And uh, just want to take you to an interesting event in the New Testament about Peter. Herod had uh, arrested Peter. And he was there in the dungeon in chains with, with heavy guard. Uh, and this is what happened in Acts 12, verse 5. Peter thus was being kept in prison. But prayer by the church was fervently being made to God uh, on his behalf. So Peter was there. And uh, what could the people do? No, they could not go, go in force and insist. No, and they, they were peaceful people. Uh, they wouldn't uh, exercise violence. No, and they were, in, in that sense, uh, powerless. But they were not powerless to intercede. And that's what they did. They, they, they prayed. You know? And because of their prayer, a great miracle happened as we read in the next verses verses 6 to 10 the angel of uh, the lord came and he tapped peter and says uh, let's go and the change miraculously uh, slipped off his off him and the gates uh, miraculously opened and the guards were asleep or uh, didn't notice them uh, going in and the angel brought him out and brought him to freedom this is what happened because of the intercession of the whole people of God. They were praying intently uh, for this particular situation. And they knew that they were powerless and the power could only come from God. And that's what God manifested by uh, uh, freeing uh, Peter. So miracles can and do happen. So this, this is the power of prayer. And, and when we pray, you know, very familiar to, to all of us, Jesus uh, saying in Luke 11, verses 9 to 10, But I tell you, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be uh, open. And this gives us the assurance. So certainly ask for yourself. What you need, you know what you need. Oh, no, not just obviously not just the material things and the, the so-called uh, uh, good things that make ordinary people happy, but what you need for the Christian life, for greater commitment, for perseverance, for more knowledge, uh, wisdom coming from God. So for yourself, you you ask for it, but better ask for others, intercede. God knows what you you need. And of course, God knows what the others need, but he, he delights when people come to him and rather than just always asking for what they need, are asking for the needs of others. And you know, brothers and sisters, if this happens in Christian community, uh, when we intercede for others, it actually is a very good deal. 
Because if you just pray for yourself, you're one person praying for yourself. But if everyone intercedes for everyone else, then I have not just me, my one person praying for myself, but I have hundreds, I have thousands. And you would have those as well with your, with your household, with your chapter, with your other brothers and sisters. And at times we put out prayer orientation and the whole worldwide community would be praying. So it's a good deal. You know? But uh, we, we, we need to be committed to uh, intercession. Okay, we move on to T. T is for thankfulness, uh, gratitude. And Paul tells us that we are to be thankful. Uh, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, In all circumstances give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. In all circumstances. Not just when you're happy. No? Not just when things are going great. But we, we, we need to learn that even more so, when you are unhappy, when things don't seem to be going uh, well, gratitude is what can help open up the, the blessings of God for you and turn uh, things around. You know? But in all circumstances, why? Because again, our focus is on, on God, not necessarily on the circumstances of our lives. And we know that uh, God is all-powerful. Now we look to God. God is always good to us. And if he's always good to us, then we need to thank him always. Even when, again, bad uh, things happen because God has a purpose that is hidden from us. How many times when things happen to you and then uh, the, the week after, the month after, the year after, uh, you, you look back and say, hey, it, it's good that that thing happened to me because after that, this other thing happened to me. If the bad thing had not happened, the good thing will not have come. We have many sharing instances of, of that. So we, we, God holds us in the palm of his hand. And he has a great purpose for us. He has a great de destiny for us. And, and he does not reveal everything to us. But, but we just simply trust that that is the case. A plan for a future full, full of, of hope. So... Uh, even when uh, there are crosses in life, first of all, to embrace the cross is part of being a disciple, as Jesus says. Uh, so crosses in life enable us to be authentic uh, disciples as we embrace our cross daily. Uh, it is, uh, but it is actually better to, to have crosses. Because again, we've spoken about this a lot of times. It can purify us. It can humble us. Uh, it can draw us closer to God. Uh, it gives us a privilege of carrying his uh, cross, sharing in his uh, suffering in a little way. Uh -huh. We can offer our crosses for the intention of others. So many, many of these uh, good things. So up or down, good or bad, always be thankful. Thankfulness gives us the right perspective. Because our focus is on God and not on circumstances. So we can remain solid in, in faith and we're not subject to the ups and downs of, of life. So always have a positive attitude, outlook. Avoid negativity from uh, entering. And, and uh, the way you, you can avoid that is to, be, to have a thankful heart. Because when negativity enters, then that's where... Uh, it leads to self-pity, to, to bitterness, to resentment, uh, even turning away uh, against God. So th those, are, those are not good things. And you don't want to open up the door to the evil one to, to bring you deeper into that uh, uh, darkness. So maintain that positive attitude and everything about God is uh, positive. So uh, the worst that can happen is a loss of faith. It's uh, rebellion against God. That's what happened to Israel after Egypt so many, many times until uh, they, they lost it all because they quickly forgot all the good things that God did for them. If only they would, they would hold on to the miracles, the many good things, then when, when the challenges come, they can always you know, go back on that and hold on to that and know that God is a faithful God who can work miracles in their lives. And so they need to be grateful for that. Be committed to thankfulness in life. 
let's go to M. And since we are missionary families, I'd like to look at uh, marriages lived according to God's order. Actually, not just important for us, obviously, but for all marriages and for the, the whole world. Now, marriage is, as you know, those who are married until death, for better or for worse. That's commitment. You, 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 you don't know how things will be five years from now, 50 years from now. But you say, oh, when you are to be sacramentally made into uh, united uh, to one, that we will remain as one together until death. That's, that's commitment. Now, unfortunately, many, including Christians, have forgotten that. They have not remained committed, and so they, they allow the trials and difficulties, the, the fights, the misunderstandings uh, to, to all come in and finally uh, break up their, their marriage. Uh, but if uh, marriage is not until death, then there are so many bad effects on that, uh, not just the uh, breaking up and separation, but uh, kids are not cared for, or people when they're afraid will be, be, still be together. So let's not have kids because we might not be able to take care of them. Or the wife might say, well, I see in many instances uh, when uh, they break up, uh, the kids are left with the, the mother. So I take care of them just by myself. So let's not have kids anymore. Uh, and of course, if the parents are not there, united in Christ for the life of the, uh, the growing up years of the kids, then they're not being formed in the Lord. So a lot of these bad things can, will happen. Uh, if if uh, John Paul II said that the future of humanity passes by a way of the family, then we, we see the consequences when family uh, breaks up, when marriage uh, breaks up. So how can our marriages be lived according to God's order? Well, there are many ways, uh, most basically in the, uh, as individuals first and foremost, that you live your life as a true Christian. But there's also the relations between husband and wife. And Paul says in Ephesians 5 that uh, the relation is to reflect the very relation of Christ and his church. That's how wonderful it is. Christ and his church. You know? And he says in Ephesians 5 verse 32, this is a great mystery. And indeed it is a great mystery. But he gives a particular order in marriage, rules in, in marriage, uh, which are unfortunately no longer accepted in, uh, uh, among many uh, today, among many uh, marriages today. You know? He, he uh, teaches about uh, submission of the wife to the husband in everything, which reflects the submission of the church to Christ. So he makes that connection, he makes that comparison. And we can really, readily see that the church should be submitted to Christ. But how come we cannot see uh, that, that uh, the, the wife should be submitted to their husbands? Well, uh, because there are the feminists who say, you know, we're, we're equal. Uh, submission is a bad thing. Uh, that means we're under, we are less than them, which is, of course, a wrong notion. Uh, and and uh, it's just a question of, of roles that are there. But uh, the husband will become abusive if we, if we do that. But no, because uh, Paul says uh, more. And he says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for you and I. Huh? And when you give your life, you have given everything else. And, and Paul says, that's the husband, you elevate your wife. You, you help sanctify them. In effect, put them on a pedestal. So how can there be oppression? How can there be, you know, uh, domination uh, if, if that is the case? You know, if, if wives only realize, and of course, husbands to leave them out. Unfortunately, <laughs> there are many husbands who don't do so. But if both husband and wife uh, lived out the order that God had given them, how wonderful that would be. And wives would be so secure in their marriage and, and really be uh, put up there, even as the husband is the head of the wife. So, this is a, a great uh, uh, 
mystery that is there. But all of that takes a lot of uh, commitment. You know? Commitment to marriage till death do us part. And commitment to live it according uh, to the ways of God. Not just our own ways, not our secular ways, not what social media uh, teaches you, not what many of these uh, advisors on, on marriage uh, teach you. But what does God teach? Okay. E, evangelization. And this is a call for all uh, to, for, for the people of God to evangelize all the nations. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when you talk of all nations, then this is a work that needs to be uh, to the ends of the earth. Now, that's what we talk about. That's a lot of work. Now, of course, uh, it's not just us. Uh, but uh, we need to also raise up many more laborers. But that's a lot of work. And, and so uh, there will be so many sufferings uh, that is there. There will be uh, great challenges. There will be great opposition from, from the enemy. So we need commitment through the ups and downs. There will be ups and downs through the victories and, and defeats. We need to just go at it because this is the final uh, commission, the final instructions of the Lord Jesus. And this is what will determine whether at the end of time when Jesus returns again, will there be a small flock or hopefully a larger flock. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important work. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the way to, to win the world for Christ. Mm -hmm. It must be done. And in today's world of darkness and sin and great evil, uh, the work of evangelization is very, very crucial. But unfortunately, even in the church, we are losing the missionary dimension. And of course, many lay Catholics do not know of this call. They, they might know about the call to Ten Commandments, love God, love your neighbor, uh, and, and all that. But to go and make disciples of all the nations, go and proclaim the gospel of salvation to all creatures, they don't know about that call. And others might know, might have heard about that, but they're too busy doing other things, uh, secular things. Or maybe even, uh, again, we talked about uh, social justice uh, issues, but not getting into evangelization, the actual proclamation of, of the word. And the harvest ought to be rich. Jesus said so. The harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So when we don't get involved and we don't help raise up many others, then this work of evangelization is what everyone suffers. But the people of God need to grow into this, and we especially... Uh, whatever the other, the rest of the church will do, we know what we are called to do, what we are called to be, and we are to go at this, and we are to be persistent, insistent, uh, do rapid, massive, worldwide evangelization. We need to be relentless. In other words, we need to be committed to the work of evangelization. Okay, letter N. Never ceasing to pray. And we saw that earlier. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Obviously, it takes a lot of uh, commitment with, with all the things that uh, one can do. Uh, of course, it ought to be easier when you're locked down by a pandemic. Uh, hopefully, you have more time. But even then, there are a lot of challenges, whether it's uh, Netflix or, or just uh, social media, uh, but, but this is something that uh, takes uh, commitment. Now, understand, I was mentioning a little bit of it uh, earlier, it doesn't always mean you're always in your prayer nook, the way we understand prayer, my quiet time for the day, my 15 minutes or whatever it is uh, for the day, or my coming before uh, the, the Lord in uh, Eucharistic adoration. But it is more a posture of the heart that happens throughout uh, the day. It's, it's awareness of God. It's uh, remaining in the presence of God. It is uh, continuing surrender to God. It is offering our lives, our whole day, uh, everything that we do, what we say, what we think, uh, to God. So it, 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 it is a challenge to pray always because there will be so many distractions that, that, that happen. And then, uh, so we, we, with commitment, we need to, as, as uh, Jesus said in uh, Luke 18, verse 1, when he related the uh, parable of the uh, 
persistent widow and the unjust judge. Uh, he said, uh, we are to pray always without becoming weary. The, the widow persisted and then didn't let go of that judge and he became afraid she might hit me. So finally he relented. He was an unjust judge, but he had to render a just decision. So our God obviously is not an unjust God, but what uh, Jesus is stressing in this, pray, pray incessantly. Do not give up. Do not grow weary. Do not be, be daunted by the obstacles that seem to, to come up. Uh, do not be distracted, even though there truly are many distractions that are around. Just go uh, at it, uh, commit to do it. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, again, unlike the unjust church, we don't need to pester God because uh, he knows what we need. He knows what is best for us. But God wants this persistent prayer uh, so that we grow in our relationship with him. So that we grow in the holiness, and well, well you know, well, what is that holiness uh, about? Uh, in Hebrews 12, verse 14, uh, the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, "Strive for peace with everyone, and for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord." So consider this also, if you will, as an investment. I want to see the Lord. I want to make it to heaven. So. Uh, I, I, in order to be able to enter heaven, I need to be holy. And how do I become holy? First, uh, primarily, primarily, most important, uh, not the only one, but most important is prayer. A basic connection with communication, uh, communing with uh, God. Okay, last uh, letter and last word uh, were words. A T, taking up the cross. And that, of course, is the mark of a true disciple. Again, Luke 9, verse 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, must deny himself, take up his, embrace his cross daily, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So uh, uh, a disciple is one who takes up his cross uh, daily. And that's very challenging. <laughs> People don't even uh, get to the point of uh, commitment because they, they avoid they don't want it. Spare me the cross, Lord. Uh, that's their prayer of intercession. Spare me. But, but that, that is part of God's intent for authentic uh, discipleship. And what can truly help us is, again, look to Jesus crucified. You pray the rosary every day. He's there in your uh, rosary. Uh, you, you look at your home. It ought to have your crucifixes, your Christian symbols. And the most basic uh, symbol is Christ crucified. You know? And we, we simply look to Jesus. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And as, as we do that, we are able to look to our eternal reward. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we are not discouraged. Rather, although our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this momentarily light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen. Uh, for what is seen is transitory, and what is unseen is eternal. Now that's a challenge. Because what we see, we see. What we experience right now, physically, materially, we, we experience. But we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And we need to look uh, beyond what is seen to what is unseen. We look beyond what is transitory. And whatever sufferings will, you know, it, it, it might be uh, a terrible uh, illness or, or a really great problem that's been there for, for years. And I really uh, empathize with those who suffer for the sake of Christ in that way. But look at it in terms of eternity. Then the time we suffer and spend in this life is just a tap of the finger compared to eternity, which has no, no, no end. And so... Uh, that, that's how, how we need to, to focus on, on Jesus, on the eternal reward, on, on, on heaven, what comes uh, after, then we can really persevere. And then there's another uh, virtue that is important. You persevere with joy. Because there are people who might say, okay, I need, to, I need to commit and persevere because I'm being told, I read all the scripture passage, yes, but you know, I'm, I'm grumbling. And Lord, you're such a hard task, taskmaster and all of that. Well, 
read the passages there are many of them also in the scriptures uh, look 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 at one james one verses two to four consider it all joy my brothers when you encounter various trials for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance be perfect so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing so consider it joy when you encounter trials because you you grow in your commitment in your perseverance in your endurance and that leads you to perfection to holiness to to sanctity uh, to to uh, being perfect as god is perfect and to being complete in in christ and to lack nothing as far as the spiritual life is concerned so take up your cross and do it joyfully so brothers and sisters that's a commitment we in MFC are called to defend the faith, family, and life. Uh, the enemy seeks to destroy faith, family, and life. And the enemy is very committed. Do not doubt the commitment, tenacity, zeal, bad kind of zeal of, of the enemy. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, through, through experience and even in war, uh, oftentimes, the one with the greater commitment prevails. And that's why it seems today as if, you know, uh, the tsunami of, e of evil is prevailing over the whole world. And uh, our church is weakening, a lot of uh, much uh, apostasy and losing Catholics by the day. So the enemy is uh, committed. So we need to be even more committed. Especially as we know that we, God has already won the victory. And we are just to partake of that victory by doing what he tells us uh, to do. So in, in going about this, in doing uh, the good that God wills us to do, let us never grow weary. Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 9, Let us no, not grow tired of doing good, for in due time we shall reap our harvest if we do not give up. How unfortunate it would be. If you were persevering, enduring, and then after a while, you know, you, you don't see a turn for the better, and then you give up, not knowing that the, 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 the reward was just there, the victory was just there the next day or the next hour. So never give up, because then uh, when, when, when you persevere, you will reap your harvest. You will be victorious. So brothers and sisters, commitment. God expects it. God will help us because it, it is not easy. But God expects it of us, so let us live it out. And I leave you with the final passage, Philippians 1 verse 6. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Trust in the word of God and you uh, our task is just to endure, to persist, to persevere, to go doggedly uh, at it in all circumstances, and Jesus will complete it for us.